Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. The second year of the conference, last session of the day. So let's get that energy going. All right. Okay. Um, I'm just going to ask for us to change the next slide. Perfect. Okay. Different tone than I was expecting, but um, today is Canada's National Day of, of National Day of Indigenous People. Let's recognize that. Yesterday, I presented some of the research related to this project, uh, related to a project that I'm working on, looking at direct seafood marketing, and I made a major faux pas that I'd like to acknowledge. I forgot the land acknowledgement. So with that in mind, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna give the full land acknowledgement. So I, I recognize that I am very privileged to be living, working, and playing on the, on the traditional ancestral and ceded territory of the Penelope First Nation, as well as the Coast Salish people and the Halkaminam speaking people. At my work at the University of Maine as postdoctoral research fellow, I work on the traditional lands of the, of the Penobscot and the Waganaki tribes. Um, over here at this conference, at the Fourth World Small Scale Fisheries Congress, we are on the lands of the Nitasin and Inu people, as well as the Nanutavut Kavut people. I apologize for mispronouncing their names. Um, the reason I'm saying this should not, I should not need to elaborate on as to why I'm talking about this, given the discussion that happened today. So I, 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 I encourage you all to reflect for a moment on why these land acknowledgements and also actions, more than just acknowledgements and words, are so important. The topic for today's uh, session is innovation, network building, and, um, and, and basically fostering collaboration in the space of community-based seafood systems. A lot of these systems rely on, uh, are, are built upon these relationships that for people foster between seafood and each other, fish harvesters and fish consumers. And so the cultural relations, the nutrition, the well-being, and the employment opportunities that they offer are important to recognize. Um, seafood is probably one of the most traded commodities, but it's also created this dynamic in which fisheries leave the, the regions where they're harvested, leave and, and disadvantage the communities that are harvesting them and take away the rights uh, of, some, of some First Nations as well as small scale or rural fishing communities. It's important to recognize these things. At the same time, there's been this growing movement of community-based, uh, community-supported fisheries, direct seafood marketing, alternative seafood networks that are trying to reinvent seafood systems. And we've got a series of speakers today with, of vibrant, with vibrant stories that are gonna be talking about how we're pushing the envelope, how we're hoping to try and change the system and revitalize local and regional seafood systems. Because ultimately the change needs to come from the bottom up and it needs to be action rather than just language and talk. So I, I don't know about you guys, but I've started seeing a lot of connections between, uh, in terms of direct seafood marketing at most of the plenaries at this conference. And, and that's telling, because clearly it's, it's on the mind of, of folks. Direct seafood marketing is a growing movement. It's something that we, has been talked about in terms of cooperatives, it's been talked about in terms of community sport fisheries. And so, it's important to recognize and really celebrate these stories. And, and that's what we're really hoping to do today. So as I've said, it's gonna be a couple of stories that are talking about, that are talking about catalyzing seafood systems, uh, particularly in the framing of fish as food, but also in terms of how dynamic and disruptive these systems are or, or have the potential to be. Um, we have a lineup of fascinating speakers. We were supposed to have Talia Young uh, speaking today, uh, and where she'd be talking about transforming local food systems. Talia could unfortunately not join us today, but instead we have um, uh, Peter Halme and Kevin Scribner, who will be talking to us about seafood on the West Coast. Uh, both Peter and Kevin are commercial seafood, uh, commercial seafood harvesters, and so floor is yours. What a great introduction. Do you have the slides? Did you get the slides? Thanks, Tom. 
do your, do your well, format comedic act. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to introduce two of my uh, unindicted co conspirators. Uh, Sarah's over here and Kevin's over here. Uh, three young ladies talked about between the three of them, they add up to 100 years of experience. The two of us add up to 100 years. So that's what's three. Anybody could do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to breeze through what we have done so far. Uh, we should be proud of it, but it's not enough. It's not nowhere near enough. We've got to go to the next step. So the first uh, 16 slides, we're just going to breeze through and get stuck on the last one where we need your help and move forward. So, Pete, I'm going to intercede and do. Uh, uh, he's going to do the first few slides. Yeah. Thanks. Kevin Scribner. Great job. Great job. <laughs> Believe him. Believe him. And we'll. Uh, there we go. All right, so we're going to end up in San Diego. Before that, I want to take you on a little bit of a tour. So next slide, please. So this is from the local catch website. You know, this is where you can go to find out where you can get direct, direct to consumer uh, seafood. Um, this is the West Coast. So I think it's, it's uh, of the United States. So pretty well stippled. There's a lot of opportunity to get uh, get your seafood out there uh, from that way. And uh, Dr. Odo, Otto's is somewhere up in that cluster up there. Next slide, please. And drilling down to Southern California, you'll see from the Bay Area up there down to San Diego, still quite, quite a bit of uh, opportunity to get your seafood. But again, we're gonna focus, Pete's gonna bring us down, drill us down to San Diego. Next slide, please. So local catch values. Um, you can go on the website and pull this, this uh, a number of them I pulled out, but also know your fish, know your fishers, you know, right, right, the threaded right into uh, uh, the values based, if you want to have out that values based system. Next slide. So I'm a co-founder of the Wave Foundation based in Portland, Oregon, and we're looking at, as we say, a sea to supper blueprint for a sustainable seafood system. And these are the components uh, that we have identified of a system that we need to pay attention to and bring values into each component and, and how the components interact with each other. You'll see I've highlighted seafood hubs and the ownership governance site, because Pete's gonna dive into that. But um, in addition to um, what, what, the, what the, the blueprint, this blueprint is attempting to do is aggregate fishers without consolidation. We've heard a lot of that in the last day and a half or two days. Again, consolidation is sim that simplifies the system. Uh, we're actually looking at aggregating to keep that diversity of supply chain going, but also at the same time, uh, be able to generate and work with markets at scale. Because that's kind of a, that's a, that's a question we, we, we direct to consumer marketers. How do we get into the food service world that is at, at scale. And the opportunity we have here with the WAVE is we actually have corporate food service engaged with us to help us so they can understand how they can support values through the system. And so that brings up my question that also Pete will deal with is how many of the local catch operations are not, can sell a full boatload of fish? There are some that can, but there's, you know, that's a challenge. That, and I think what the WAVE wants to do is bring that market at scale to the um, small scale fishers. Next, please. So seafood co-ops, Pete's gonna talk about that as an opportunity for an uh, ownership government uh, format. And I just have to bow to Bonnie McKay who gave a, a tremendous presentation in the plenary on co-ops. And I, uh, I invited her to join us. I don't know if she's with us, but I hope she does. But, you know, this is some information about co-ops and we're, we've been talking to people uh, in Georgia and also in Halifax. We're just reaching out to get as much wisdom about cooperatives as, as we can. Also, um, I haven't had the opportunity to do work in Japan and become aware of the large home delivery consumer cooperatives are there. There's one operating in PAL system, again, on the consumer side they have 1.5 million members. And so I think they can show us how to have fish co-ops and fish uh, gatherings interact with the consumer side and still in a cooperative format. Next, please. So uh, just some examples on the Pacific Coast, Seafood Producers Co-op based in Alaska and Washington. They've been in existence from 1944. They have over 500 members. 
the independent fishermen at Kringer Hawk Cooperative way out in Western Alaska, they actually used the cooperative mechanism to help rekindle a fishery that did not have a market for five years because it was so remote. So they've, they've realized the, you know, the, the gaining of capacity by working together. Port Orford Sustainable Seafood, that's very much like uh, uh, Skipper Otto. So I'll defer to Sonia talking about Skipper Otto and that as, a, as an example. This association from San Francisco, I put them up there because they worked together, uh, formed an association so they could actually get cat share allocations as an association. Again, um, in the previous um, conversation here, maybe in the plenary, we talked about how can you aggregate fishers to be able to have and own and aggregate or have access in aggregation of, of cat shares. Well, they figured out to do that within the legal structure of the US. PCFFA, that's an association that works mostly on the policy, policy side, because that's another capacity that we fishers need to have. It's how to, how to be able to work effectively with government and uh, both at the state and federal level. So P PCFFA is an example of that. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Pete with the San Diego case study. And actually, San Diego Fisherman's Working Group is just a vehicle to get things on. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to talk about first the uh, tuna harbor dockside market. Pete, uh, you know, turn face the audience. It's your you know, somebody you're talking to. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> That's why he came along to give me counters. <laughs> Every three minutes he's been interrupted. <laughs> to the harbor dockside market. Uh, in San Diego, we have four ways of uh, direct marketing. Direct marketing has taken off in the last 10 years. We have a, a market at Tuna Harbor. We have one at Driscoll's Wharf. We do direct deliveries. We deliver directly to about 30 or 40 restaurants. And we have a, a couple groups doing online sales. Next slide. Uh, the Tuna Harbor Dockside Market started in 2014 after a long battle to get it done. It's a fisherman's market, which was not written into law. We had to pass a law to make a fisherman's market possible. And it, it, it sets out the rules, only local fishermen selling their catch. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't pay attention to governance. So it's governed by, it's an LLC governed by five people and uh, three of them were not fishing. Which was a, so annual sales, uh, where it's going around 150,000. The pandemic started, the people showed up on the docks and sales went up 50%. So on a typical day, on a typical Saturday, this is a kind of list, 25 to 30 different kinds of fish, different prices, the prices are set by the fishing. Next slide, please. Uh, so, so let me just walk you through, uh, I'm, I'm the manager of the market. And I took that because it's a fantastic job and it pays me $200 a month for about 100 hours or 200 hours of work. <laughs> so on Thursday, I sent out a group text to about 20 fishermen. What are you fishing for? What are you gonna catch? What are you gonna bring in? They, they all get on and they share it with one another. So when one sees that too much of something is coming in, they'll fish for something else. By Friday afternoon, they get their act together. Uh, they send in how many pounds of each species, what price they're gonna charge, and then, then I put it, uh, we send out a text to about uh, 4,000 people, Facebook followers, 15,000, so on, and the, the list goes out. Uh, one big problem we had is we, we instituted a policy called legacy vendors, because we want to limit the vendors coming so they can sell their whole catch. So after two years, we recognize that certain people were showing up 50 weeks in a year and we allow them to check their one species that they would be allowed to bring in exclusively to anybody else. Anybody else could only bring it in if he ran out, if he could bring it, but only sell after he sold. This is unfair, but it was needed to, to run the market properly. So 5.30 a.m., there's an empty pier with nothing on it. We roll out everything uh, from booths and everything. We set up a pier, uh, some 20 booths, and then we set up a, a, a cutting booth set up according to health standards. We roll out the water, everything. There's nothing on the pier. Wastewater has gotten rid of uh, by a fantastic system that was set up uh, uh, 400 years ago by somebody. <laughs> and by 2 p.m. the market closes, we break down everything to store it. We provide important services, product aggregation, marketing, online sales, 
but not everything that the community needs. Next slide, please. How am I supposed to watch them and read that at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what are the successes of the market? Increased price, reduced carbon footprint, and a recognition by the authorities. The port has recognized our market as an important thing to the port because we bring 500 to 1,000 people down to the docks to look at it, and they're coming down, and we see them, and we can talk to them. They're coming to the working fishing harbor. They visit the working fishing harbor. Uh, <laughs> I can, I'm 5,000 miles from them, so I can tell you that we have great cooperation. <laughs> <laughs> they would probably throw me out. And one, one thing we noticed is fishermen in a big city like San Diego don't involve their families like they do in rural areas, but the families do come down. The families, the, the wives and the kids all help out at the market. We have six or seven families that come every week. We use a full utilization of fish. We have a a wide variety of people living in San Diego and the Filipino community, the guys come down just for the fish heads. They don't want the animal, they just want the fish heads. They buy, so we uh, instead of using it for bait, we cut it up and people come and buy the eyeballs and the fish heads. I've never eaten it myself, <laughs> so I can't vouch for it. And it has become a meeting place. Everybody knows that every Saturday from eight o'clock to two o'clock, there's gonna be 15 to 20 fishermen there. So if you're a scientist or something, you want to get some uh, knowledge of some fishery, or you want to know where, where your knowledge that you contribute ends up. This is where the fish end up, this is how they're sold, and these are the people buying it. These are the successes. Next slide, please. Uh, but, but we got limits. There's limits to the market. The number of vendors are limited. It's only open one to two days a week. The rest of the week, the customers go somewhere else. And the, mainly the ceiling of the market is about 30 fishing. When, when an economist told me this, I was really upset. I thought we could keep growing and growing and growing. He said, never. He says, your market is 30 fishermen and less than 20% of the fish that you catch at the, at the market uh, in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And these are all the numbers. Uh, next slide. And so I said, got the guys together. I said, this is the goal. We want participation by 60% of fishermen in the port, which is about 70 fishermen, 70 boats. We want to direct 60% of the total fish landed in San Diego. We want to market all of them. That's about 3 million pounds of fish, which we weren't going to do that way. So how do we get there? Next slide. Well, first of all, uh, one of the things holding us up is a, a seafood hub. We've got to be able to aggregate the fish and, and we've got to have a pier with access to trucks a crane to offload fish, freezers, ice machine, refrigerator. We need all those things in one area, preferably right there uh, at the docks. And the services, we need a manager, we need marketing communications, aggregation, we need all those things. So how do we get that? Next slide, please. A co-op. After a lot of thought to this process, and I'm glad to hear it, at least a dozen speakers today and yesterday talked about how good co-ops were and how bad co-ops were. <laughs> and, and so you got, uh, the market isn't a cooperative structure. We want to develop a cooperative structure of management. Uh, the California Food and Ag has a, a law about the marketing law about uh, establishing marketing associations, which then can uh, bargain collectively and can do a lot of things that you can't do individually. <clears throat> and we've got to start off by, by getting, uh, in San Diego, we got nine gear types. If we're going to have a co-op, all nine gear types have to be represented by somebody in that gear type. And uh, we have everything, and we talk, uh, I heard a lot of talk about small scale, big scale, and so on. Every fisherman that lands in San Diego is included, period. I don't care if his boat is 30 foot, 40 foot, 50 foot, or 70 foot. We have long liners, uh, 60 foot long liners that go out 1,000 miles. We have dive boats, 20 foot dive boats that go out half a mile. They're all included because we want to sell everybody's catch. And everybody adheres to the laws, very strict laws, is fishing is sustainable. We can't tell him how to fish differently. He abides by the rules and it's good enough for us. So, uh, so now I've got to talk to Josh about obtaining funding, but he's going to help with that. Uh, we got to develop a business plan and marketing plan, hire staff and manager. So this is where we want to get to. We're not there yet, so don't, don't mistake me. We don't have all this. But how do we, 
We came here 5,000 miles, or Kevin only traveled 3,000 miles. And so we got, there we go, 13,000 miles between the three of us. Anyhow, we came here with questions. Anybody has experience? Anybody has some pointers? I saw, I heard a young lady from France. Fantastic. Some of their associations are, are 400 years old. So when we're starting brand new, they've done it for 400 years. So I know we can learn a lot. So we're open to learning something. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, would you like to take some questions? Could we oh, some sure. time? I thought um, I answered everything. <laughs> I have a question. If, you know, if I wanted to get urchin at the seed yogurt uh, at the market, who would I go to? You would go to my son because I came up here only because my, I, I took market day off on Saturday to, to fly up here and also took Sunday to fill up. And my uh, luggage went to Toronto and I don't know where else before we got here. My, we have a sea urchins at the market every Saturday, 52 weeks of the year. Uh, my son started fishing with me and the little bastard gets about 80% of the catch. You know, and, and I, I don't like to admit it. So <laughs> at, at first I cut his clothes off. I didn't give him air. I slowed him down a lot. But, uh, and, anyhow. So, so we have sea urchins. When we first started eight years ago, we sold 30 or 40 sea urchins on a Saturday. This last Saturday, he sold 300. He, and he increased the price from $3 to $8. And because one thing I didn't mention, every guy at every booth is the captain of that booth. He decides how he sells it, the price he asks for, what he does. The market doesn't tell him anything. We don't control their stuff. And if you wanted to charge, but they've, they, between them, uh, range for a price, so there isn't a good price and a bad price and so on, but they, they'll lower the price sometimes. So uh, you, the best quality of sea urchins in the world is in San Diego. And you know why? The quality of the harvester. And modesty makes me so awesome. I, I see one more question and then we'll switch ground. Okay, yeah, I actually want a little bit more detail about how that price setting happens. Like, well, how does that seem like a real point of friction amongst the fishers? Like, I'm selling high, I'm selling low. How do they negotiate that? Look, you son of a bitch, you lower your price to that price. And everything's fine. All right. Uh, we set a price, we set a price. There's an X vessel price, what, what they get paid by processor, and a price uh, at the wholesale level. All the prices are set in that boundary. So it's quite a big boundary, and we try to set it right in the middle. So they, they go to one another when they when they start off. They, uh, the fellows start. That, that's a cooperation. They go up and down. And say, what are you selling it for? That seems low. So let's try it this week. And if it's too hot, you see, we're not stuck by management or anything. We try an idea. If that doesn't work, next week we try something else. So they they talk to one another. And if they can't decide, then, then, then some old fart comes in and said, "I'm opening up, and you guys can't sell." It. But that, it, that's the cooperative part. And that part is, is great. When you see 15 fishermen or 20 fishermen trying to agree on something to their own benefit, because they don't want to start competing. They don't want to start saying uh, what's going on. And the funny thing is uh, the people before the pandemic, the, the booths are lined up on the pier, 15 or 18 booths. Everybody was fighting. I, I allocate booths uh, at the beginning of the day. Uh, everybody wanted to be the first booth. And during the pandemic, because that's how they shop, they went to the first booth and bought it and so on. Now the people walk all the way to the end, check everything out, and shop coming back. So now everybody <laughs> wants to have the last booth. <laughs> and they found out there's not much difference. People will, will go to, but the people find out that if they're there 20, 30 weeks in a row, the customers come back to them. That's, that's their fishermen. I'd like to introduce my wife who's sitting uh, patiently in the back who came with me all this way. <laughs> I found this 35, 40 years ago, I found this beautiful lady. She was intelligent and good looking, and she had one fatal flaw. She was a bad judge of character. <laughs> so I married her. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, up next, we have Sonia Strobel from uh, Skipper Rogers Community Sport Fishery. I think she doesn't need any more of an introduction. Probably uh, they're sick of hearing from me right now. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, is there anybody here who hasn't heard me speak yet at the conference? Because okay, then I well. Oh, you need me over there. Oh, look at that, Jordan. <laughs> Like a trip on the thing. There we go. Okay. Um, right. Well, uh, thank you for having me. It's really lovely to be here with you guys. I have old, long time pals from local catch and community sport fishery world. Um, you've, lo most of you have heard me speak a little bit about Skipper Auto Community Supported Fishery. So I will whip through some of my introductory slides for you to kind of see what I'm talking about. And in case you were in a session and you were like texting and not listening to me, which would be okay, I wouldn't be offended. But, uh, so I'm the co-founder uh, and CEO of Skipper Auto Community Supported Fishery on the uh, west coast of British Columbia, Canada on traditional unceded Coast Salish territory, the land of the Musqueam and the Squamish and the Slay with Tooth. And uh, we, uh, next slide, please. Um, if you've heard my story, Skipper Auto is not like Captain Highliner. It's not like a, a, a brand, a, a no name. This is my father in law, Otto, here, who started fishing in the 60s. My husband, Sean, when he started fishing, was about seven. And that's us. So uh, uh, 14 years ago, uh, pretty much exactly the time that we came up with the idea for Skipper Auto. So I married into a fishing family, struggling with all the same kinds of things Pete's talking about, about how do we sell our, our cash for a fair market and um, how do we build a, a better food system for, for people. And so uh, we did it all. We did phone trees. We drove our fish to the prairies to sell it at farmer's markets. We stood at dock sales. I worked crazy long hours while I was pregnant and was a high school teacher. And then I took a night school teaching job so that I could run the CSF in the daytime and teach English at night. I mean, I've done all of these things. And so uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how it works today. If you want to go to that slide. Um, uh, yeah, actually go to the next slide. I'll work through these a little faster. So uh, the way that it works today is that uh, members buy a share in the catch before we go fishing. And that means they use this little handy share size calculator, say, oh, there's two people in my household. We eat fish two to three times a month and slide it along and it'll help them decide how much fish to prepay. So say it's $300, they pay for that. Goes into the credit to the online store here. And uh, so members only can log into the online store and it just kind of works like Shopify or something like that. You log in, but you've got your credit in there already. You pick and choose what you want from the catch anytime you want throughout the year. You've got a whole year of subscription. You choose your pickup location and go to the next slide. We have about 90 pickup locations, actually more than 90 pickup locations now between uh, Victoria and Ottawa and between Fort St. John and Windsor, I guess, as far south north as we are. Uh, and so you choose your pickup location, uh, next slide, and then you get your seafood with a label like this. So it's all coming flash frozen to you uh, with the label about who caught it, where, when, how, the bio, the scientific name, the things that we think should be on all labels in Canada. Um, next slide, we've got, um, you know, we moved on from just our fishing family. We're a collective of 40 fishing families. Um, you can see a bunch of them here. And uh, next slide, we have, uh, this year we have about 8,300 members uh, in the in Skipper Auto who pre-purchased the share of the cash. Uh, so that's how it's grown over those 14 years. Um, yeah, next slide. Um, so what's next for us? I want to talk a little bit about something I haven't talked about before. But well, what, what are we doing right now? Um, what are we excited about? So um, in the last session, if you were in that one on governance, uh, we talked a little bit about how Skipper Auto chose to be a for-profit, not, not a co-op. And so this is a good contrast because Pete was talking about their choice to move toward a co-op, some of their you know, things that they're not happy with with the for-profit business model. Um, and, and just briefly touching on that, um, we chose that model because we heard from fishermen in our community that's what they preferred. They didn't want to have to attend board meetings and uh, you know those kinds of things. They just wanted a fair buyer, and so we responded in terms of what they wanted. They wanted to be able to collect employment insurance, which in Canada they can't do if they're owners of a co-op. Um, so there are many reasons why that was the preferred choice for them. And one thing I forgot to mention in the last session on this topic is that. Uh, in my experience of having started this, I'm sure people will echo, I'm you'll echo, you'll understand this, 
Starting a community supported fishery is a labor of love. It's a lot of work. It's an incredible amount of work. And one of the upsides of starting a business that you own is that if you're successful, you might have a thing that you own and, and you might be able to give it to your kids or you might be able to sell it and retire one day, right? I'm not talking about being a multimillionaire. I'm just talking about the labor you put into building something that you could maybe sell in the end. And so I've seen many, many models where that social enterprise model is successful in part because the founder, the entrepreneur of the social venture wants to see social outcomes, but they also don't want to slave for the next 40 years at minimum wage and then walk away, right? So it's something to think about is why we've chosen that model. Next slide. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk about what's next. I wanted to talk about growth. So Skipper Auto has grown a lot. Um, we are at about, uh, last year we had about three points. $4 million in revenue. We'll probably hit about $4 million in revenue this year. We've grown a lot. Um, and how do you decide when to stop growing? How, when, how do you decide when is enough? Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we make decisions about that and some decisions we made this year. So you can click again. So I've talked about this before. We have these things that we call the five key considerations for decision making, skip or auto. And that's conservation, reconciliation, and decolonization protecting a way of life in coastal communities and fishing communities, food security and food sovereignty, and then the stability and resilience of the model. Because if we do all those things, but the model breaks down and we burn out and we all quit, then we don't have anything, right? So it has to, we have a rubric. So we say, okay, it has to score kind of four or five out of five on each of these things, if it's a thing we're gonna do. So before we make any decision, we look at that. Um, and so, <laughs> Um, yeah, so my point is about that, for-profit businesses, I think, are not inherently evil. It's how you decide and what you decide to do with them. And so if we are using something like this to make decisions, whether it's two fishermen or 200 fishermen, then in theory, we should be having, uh, you know, achieving the social and environmental impact <coughs> objectives. So um, I'll, I want to tell you a story about how we used that to make an important decision this year. So you can click on the next slide, I think. Um, so... COVID, we experienced a, a huge bump in growth. We grew about 300% over two, two years where we expected to do that over, you know, many, like three, three years or something like that. And uh, we realized where, where, where we work is on federally subsidized fisheries land. It's uh, the False Creek Fisheries work. And so we have a net locker, which we used to just store nets in, but now we have two walk-in freezers and a kind of pick and pack area. And we kind of put some walls and some heaters in so that we can work there year round. And that's where our staff pack orders. And we realized that if this growth was gonna keep up like this 300% growth, we were busting out of the seams of this place and we were gonna to have to go off site, right? So stick with me here, you follow the logic, right? You're, you're on this business, it's growing, you're freaking out, like what are we gonna do? We need a 5,000 square foot facility, click. So we hire some architects. And we start searching for facilities and get some, you know, uh, the real estate people involved. You can click again. And we go, we go down this route and we, the dollar signs are starting to pile up. And we realize we get into the point where we actually have a, a, a lease uh, ready to go. And we get out the rubric again. And we ask ourselves, is this the most efficient way to have the social environment impact that we want to have? Like, yes, we thought we had to do this to keep growing, but is growth the only way to do that? And the answer was no. So we pulled out of the lease. We said, thank you very much. We're not going to do it. And then we thought, well, what the heck are we going to do then? <laughs> um, and so we decided that actually we would be better off to cap the growth of companies, figure out how much fish can we move out of the False Creek Fisherman's Work, the space that we have in the subsidized land, and we'll put a cap on it, and we'll say that's all it's going to be. But that's not everything, because we don't want to say that's all the impact we can create with our lives. I'm not satisfied with that. There's more impact that I can have in my life. So we started to think about what we could do next. Then click to the next slide. Uh, software. So uh, over the last 14 years, we've used every version of software you can think of. In fact, Excel spreadsheets. No, no, before that, back of a napkin, how many numbers, how much fish should they get? 
Um, then we used Excel spreadsheets. And then we used all the different tools that are for community supported agriculture, like Farmigo and Small Farm Central, which is now called Harvey. And we used all these different tools, but they were always like a round peg in a square hole. It just never really quite did what we needed it to do. And so many of the software platforms out there are designed for the industrial food system, right? Which has very different outcomes. The purpose of that food system is how do you extract as much as possible from the earth for profits for shareholders, right? That's the purpose. And so if you're not careful and you use those software tools, you end up with mission drift. And the next thing you know, you're just a small and less successful version of a big food company. And so we knew for us, you know, we had um, kind of uh, modified a, a software system and uh, we, we talk about Port Orford Sustainable Seafood, the, the uh, um, CSF in Oregon, they onboarded to our little hodgepodge of software as well. And we've been limping it along for the last five years or so. And we realized it wasn't gonna be sufficient. And we, we actually needed a custom tool to do what community supported fisheries do. And so we very reluctantly uh, got into software. We applied for a grant, we got a quarter million dollars from the BC Agritech Foundation from British Columbia. And for the last year, we hired software architects. Did you know that's a thing? I didn't know that was a thing. You need architects for software to make sure that it's actually gonna do what you think it's gonna do in the end. And they're doing a beautiful job. These are some screenshots of it. It's launching in the next few weeks. Part of that grant was to onboard the next five users of the software because we believe, and we, we, this is what we believe now, and this is the decision and the pivot that we've made to cap Skipperado and say, this is the little engine that could, and we want it to keep going. We figure about 10,000 numbers is the sweet spot for that. We're gonna cap it, we'll have a wait list. But we're gonna put our energy and our attention into proliferating the, skip, the CSF model, right? And so the software allows us to do that. But we also realize it's not just software. You can't just say, here's the keys to the kingdom, good luck, build yourselves a CSF, right? It's more than that. Uh, what, that was our experience with Port Orford. We've been working with them for the last four or five years to onboard them to our buy down style CSF. And they were having a lot of success with it, but they were sort of like, I don't know, it's not working the way it's working for you guys. And so we did a two day like conference with them on Zoom. And we just got into all the details of what they were doing. And I realized that there was a bunch of stuff that we're doing, they weren't doing, that I didn't realize that they weren't doing. And so then we realized that it's not just software, but it's actually like a mentorship program that we need to develop. So that's the kind of direction for Skipper Auto next. I think that's it for you can click to the next slide. We really believe that the, that the next big thing is this proliferation of the model. So uh, some of the very next users, uh, Natasha Gallup is one of our fishers. She's a shop first nation from Port Alberni in uh, BC. And she uh, is doing her MBA in indigenous business at Simon Fraser University. And she would like to use the software and the model to start a Port Alberni based community supported fishery by the shot fishers, but for the whole of Port Alberni community can pre buy their fish from that community. We're working with um, the uh, hunters and trappers organization of Tolobarak in Nunavut, who are interested in using the software for distributing traditionally hunted meats and fish within their community. Uh, and it goes on and on hives for humanity who are actually doing honey. So it's not fish, but the software is also applicable to that. And so we are building a, a, a long list of potential users for, for the software. And that's what we're really excited about. It's about impact and, and how can we use the experience that we've had to help uh, proliferate the model. So that's all for me. I think that's what I have to say. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think I, most of your customers are like home users, yeah? They are, yeah, they all have, are. Mm -hmm. Have you ever considered selling to like institutions or restaurants? And if so, what would that take? And if not, why? Yeah, so we did consider selling. The question, if there's anybody listening on that thing, I'll repeat it. The question is, have we considered selling to restaurants or um, institutional buyers? Why, why not? So we did consider it. We did a few experiments and uh, we decided it wasn't the direction for us. For a couple of reasons. One is I think you need to get laser focused on what you do well and do that. And I think when you get spread too thin, you get inefficient and it's messy. Uh, I think if you focus on doing one thing and doing it really well, you're more efficient. So that's one reason. The other thing is that we found in the experiments that we did with restaurants 
and with retail, they're all completely different business models. They have different needs, different software, different everything. So now you basically have three different businesses. And those businesses all take a margin. And so they, and the margins in restaurants and retail are lean, and they need to mark it up so they can make some money to cover up their costs. And that drives down the price that we can pay harvesters, and therefore that drives down the impact that we could have. So we felt that for us, we'd be more efficient to just focus on direct to consumer and be able to funnel as much money as possible to harvesters. Yes, sir. Uh, I was interested in your list of principles that you had in consideration, but I think Colin yeah. had a really interesting way to make a decision. One of them was food security and food sovereignty. Uh -huh. <clears throat> My question is, whose food security are you considering and, and how is that different from sovereignty? When yeah, you that's have a model where you're sending food everywhere or <laughs> across places. Uh -huh. What do you think about food Yeah, security? good question. The question is about food sovereignty slash food security. For whom, whose food are we talking about? Who are we feeding and who are we talking about? Okay. I think for us, uh, we're focusing on uh, domestic markets, so Canadian seafood for Canadian consumers is kind of what we're considering. Um, we think about food sovereignty, we're thinking about who controls that, and so who has uh, decision, who has the right to make decisions around how that food is harvested, who eats it, where it goes. So some of that food sovereignty has to, involves the fishing community. So in terms of harvesters and their choices around who they want to sell their fish to and who they're sharing to. Food security, more around Canadian consumers, um, knowing that they're going to have access to local food, despite pandemics and climate change and other things may happen, that they have a, a straighter line to their food source. Some of the two things kind of different. One is the Canadian population as a whole, and the other is the producers. The producers, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I heard you are an enthusiast of all Yes, we yeah. all very yeah. enjoyed that. In fact, uh, we can meet uh, because we have a lot uh, of uh, such initiative also in France that maybe we can share ideas as you ask, and particularly for fresh fish uh, and then of this type of, uh, of distribution and collaboration, maybe as you said, with other people that they, they sell also their own products and do something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can take some time if you like more absolutely, and, absolutely. Uh, yeah. discuss uh, with you because I think it's not maybe the room for that, but, uh, but yes, I would love to. I, uh, I, yeah, I would like to share with you. We're talking auctions also, which you also yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. I, I spoke at Urgency. Do you know that organization, Urgency? They do a support for farmers to, in France, in Europe, in the whole EU, yeah. And so they're interested in the community supporting fisheries. And we have uh, the other example is that uh, uh, I was I was thinking when you spoke, uh, we have uh, you visit uh, one area and you go from farm to farm, including fisheries, uh -huh. uh, and then you buy things from yeah, different producers. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, during weekend, especially this is uh, during weekend, especially at summer. Mm -hmm. where tourists are in the area mm -hmm. and they go from farm to farm. Or uh, then you have uh, markets, uh, small markets, but you can have different type of product. And uh, for fresh fish, it's another story. So Because you're have, talking fresh vegetables, right? So none of it is... They, they have fresh vegetables, they can have beef, they can have... A, oh. it's, it's really producers and they run uh, Usually at evening market in one of the farm, mm -hmm. and the people are coming to buy at that uh, at that place all the cheese, uh, everything. What people have, it, it, it's really enjoying the uh, initiative of, of people. So we can discuss more. Absolutely, absolutely. So I one question for you. Yeah. My question about being able to sell all the boats catch yes. with your 40 members in your yeah. business plan, yeah. does it satisfy that? Yeah, so there are some there are some harvesters where we're still not buying their whole catch, but that was the objective was to buy everything that all 40 of them catch no matter what they catch. <coughs> so there's a few like our tuna harvesters, they keep some of their catch because they sell it. They live on Quadra Island and they want to sell uh, on their local island. They couldn't access the processing themselves, and so we can process for them, cold store for them, and then they can take their tuna and sell themselves. So we have some things like that, but yes, that's the, the objective. Yes, sure. Buy every fish, no matter what it is that they catch. Yeah.
All right, so next up we have Jordan Richardson. She is the network manager for the local catch network. Uh, it's a community of practice, and I'm sure Jordan will be sharing more details about what local catch does. Jordan, over to you. Yes, hello, everybody. I can't see you all, but I can hear you laughing. So that's very calming. Um, I can see myself on the screen here, but I hope you all are having a nice evening. As Sahir mentioned, my name is Jordan Richardson and I help to manage the Local Catch Network. Local Catch is a network of seafood harvesters and businesses that participate in direct marketing, as well as technical assistance providers, researchers, and partnering organizations with the common mission of strengthening local and regional seafood systems. Local Catch was formalized back in 2011 by folks like the ones that you guys are hearing from on the panel today um, and others um, who operated or supported the development of community supported fisheries um, and values based fisheries across the United States and Canada. The network was founded on common interests, values, and objectives, and still maintain those to this day. So, where is Local Catch Network now? Over the course of a decade, Local Catch has grown to over about 500 members and has been able to expand the activities that facilitate connections across geographies, people, and the seafood system. Today, Local Catch Network, Network focuses our work in three areas, which are network building, technical assistance, and research. So network building is a really big priority of Local Catch. Um, and since the inception of the network, uh, members have worked together to build a foundation of trust and connectivity. Members co-created core values, which Kevin referenced earlier in his um, talk today, um, that guide the network and aim to create a higher level of accountability internally within the network and then externally to the public. Um, we ask that people, when they come and join the network, that they align with the core values that were co-created by network members just to be able to facilitate a culture of trust and a shared understanding of the goals that we're working towards. Ultimately, this promotes knowledge sharing, deeper connections and systems of support across the network and the sector. So I could talk to you guys all day about what I think is valuable about having networks and network building, but I'm gonna share with you some um, anecdotes that I've heard over and over again from our network members about what they see as the value of being a part of the Local Catch Network. Um, first of all, the ability to hear from, a, from people with diverse perspectives, voices, and knowledge bases. Um, this can oftentimes foster innovation and build bridges between sectors and people. So an example of that is the project that Sonia is working on with Skipper Auto. Um, the ability for her to be able to share this with the existing network um, of fishermen and uh, seafood harvesters and businesses who are part of the network who are interested in incorporating um, uh, technology like that into their operations. Um, secondly, uh, networks can really foster resilience. So an example of this was that happened within the, our network is at the onset of COVID. As we all know, a lot of things shifted and changed within a short period of time. Every day, every hour, you were hearing different updates and kind of a lot of uncertainty around what was going to happen, especially within uh, the food system. And so local catch network members were able to come together and mobilize really quickly um, to share information about all of these changes that were happening within a short period of time and the pivots that each one of their businesses were taking in order to adapt to these changes. And so in a lot of ways, having this existing network and being able to share information quickly and efficiently and um, kind of lean on one another through these challenging times can um, help to uh, just reduce the amount of shock that is experienced by the people who are part of the system and the system itself. Uh, many members of the network also reference the importance of just being able to have people that they can talk to and feel less alone in the work that they do. And so having that support system of people that understand your challenges and successes that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis can be really powerful. And then 
there's also a lot of opportunities for collaborative learning and collective action as a network. So we aim to create spaces for people to connect, um, to share their knowledge, to open up and hear from different perspectives and uh, you know diverse voices, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and it's just a really great, great way for people to continue to expand the way that they think and also um, contribute to the discussions that are had within the network. So I want to share a few of the ways that we help to facilitate network building. Um, and that includes uh, at the very beginning of people coming on to the network, we tr try our best to have one-on-one -on -one calls with people to understand um, you know, why did they join the network? What was interesting to them? What are they hoping to learn? Um, where are those connections missing that they wish they had? And so we can help to try to put together people, um, but then also resources for people to be able to access um, and to just start to build that relationship with people. Um, when people come onto the network, we have, um, communications channels that we add them to. So we have an internal listserv that can be used by our network members to communicate. And so um, the listserv can be used for people to ask questions. Um, there's a lot of discussion about core values um, on that listserv. There's a lot of questions about what is local. <laughs> and so there's all of these really interesting conversations that can, can be had um, between network members. Um, and it's an open forum and tool for them to be able to use to connect with people across geographies. Um, we also have the Seafood Finder, which you saw that Kevin had um, on this PowerPoint. I'm really glad he had that um, to be able to show you because that's also another way for people who are interested in purchasing local seafood to be able to use a tool to find that within their area and, and get to know their local fishers better. Um, another thing that we do to try to facilitate network building is by offering virtual meet and greets. And so, Currently, we are putting on a series of, um, of meet and greets where um, different people throughout the network um, lead these discussions about the work that they're doing so people can learn more about that and understand ways that they can engage further. Um, and so it's a really great opportunity for people to, again, deepen those relationships and connections that they have across the network. We have an in-person seafood Summit that's coming up. It's going to be our fourth one um, since the start of the network. And when I first started in this position, I heard nothing uh, more than about the local seafood summit. And I think from what I've heard is one, there's really good food there. But then secondly, um, and most importantly, is it was a good opportunity for people to come together and meet face to face and um, learn from sessions, but more so than that was that networking piece where people just wanted to continue to deepen those relationships with others that were part of the network. So if you guys are interested in attending another conference, um, we do have our local seafood summit coming up in October, and we have a lot of really great discussions that would be had there, including things like scaling up inclusive businesses, um, case studies um, of uh, markets, um, how to market your catch, um, processing and discussions around core values. So it's a really great time to um, get to know the network a little bit better and learn while you're there. Um, and then I mentioned this before, but one-on-one -on -one connections, um, that's something that we try to facilitate. So when people come on to the network um, or if people reach out to me individually um, and ask a question of, hey, do you know somebody that's doing, that is really familiar with onboard HACCP? Um, or whatever it is, then um, we have this, this pool of people who um, are surprisingly, um, I shouldn't say surprisingly, but a lot of times I'm just so shocked by how willing and interested people are in connecting with others as part of this network. It's really, um, it's really astonishing. And I'm not just saying that, uh, um, I really mean that um, people are really just eager to connect with other people and share what they know. Um, so um, we try to incorporate network building across all of these areas of work that we're participating in. So um, 
in addition to just that network building piece of it, we incorporate that into our technical assistance offerings and research as well. So let's see. So we do provide some technical assistance um, to new and existing community, community supported fisheries who are part of the network. Um, or people who aren't technically a part of the network. We usually are pretty open about that. Um, but this past year, we launched a business accelerator program. Um, it's a cohort-based program. It is a virtual program um, for existing businesses who are wanting to scale their operations. Um, so we have incorporated these educational sessions ranging from accounting, marketing, taxation, pretty much anything you need to run and operate a business. Um, but we also really saw the importance of incorporating that network building piece into, um, into this program. And so we set aside, intentionally set aside these networking periods that were open um, for participants of the program to come together and decide what is it they want to want to talk about? What do they want to learn about? Is it just that they want to get to know each other a little bit better. Do they want to talk about something specific um, to help them with their business? And so we wanted to create this space for people to um, connect. And one of the things that came out of those networking sessions, um, some of the discussions that evolved were around how to increase accessibility of seafood to uh, their various communities. And so as a result of that discussion, they got to learn these different, um, these different practices that other businesses were doing in order to increase accessibility. Um, and um, many people at the end of the program indicated that they, were, they planned on incorporating some of those practices into their businesses. And so had we not had that networking time for people to just openly discuss topics that were of interest to them, you know, that might not have come from that program. Um, we also, I just want to mention really quickly that we provide some technical assistance around um, helping people apply for grant funding. So one, um, we try to increase the awareness of opportunities um, that are available to people who are in our network um, and support them through the application process. Um, and um, over the past two years, we've worked with the USDA specifically um, to ensure that more people were aware of um, they have a local food program that they um, fund different proposals um, for people who are focused on, on strengthening, strengthening those local and regional uh, food systems. So in 2001 was our first year um, offering technical assistance um, and helping people um, again, just become more familiar with the grant program and apply for that. Um, and over $3 million of funding um, ended up being distributed to those seafood related projects, the ones who ended up applying for funding. Um, this past year, we hosted a forum where we brought in people from the network who received that funding um, to speak about their experiences because I, I just feel like there's so much validity um, and importance in making sure that people can share those successes with others. So, um, you know, others can look to them and say like, this is something that I can pursue as well. Um, so lastly, but not least, um, Local Catch also um, participates or conducts research. And um, this uh, kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about how important network building um, activities are. Um, because the existing network that we have, there's so much trust there and connectivity. Um, there are people that are interested and ready to engage in these research opportunities that come up. They are so knowledgeable and they want to inform the work that's being done um, in order to strengthen those local and regional seafood systems. And so with that, I am... I guess I was going to pass it over to Sahir, but maybe I'll, I'll pause here um, to see if there are any questions. But otherwise, Sahir is going to share a little bit more about the research that Local Catch um, is working on. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, let's open it up. Okay. So in the interest of time, um, I'm going to maybe just not talk too much about the research and instead just move directly to Josh. 
Um, but if you are interested in learning more about the research being conducted by the Local Cache Network, I'd recommend you check out the Local Cache Network website. Um, there's a page called Research, which lists a lot of the research that the network is doing. And a lot of this network, a lot of this research is in the direct sequel space. So very relevant to what we're discussing today. Awesome. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Joshua Stoll. He is um, the founder of the Local Catch Network, assistant professor at the University of Maine. And Josh, over to you. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. I think I'm the, the last presenter here, and I'm going to spend only about five minutes. That's the only time that Sahir gave me. Um, so I'm going to be really quick. And really, the, the punchline, actually, will everyone raise their hand? I'm inviting anyone who has their hand up to join the network and be part of this work. So thank you for all for your willingness. Um, uh, yeah, so my name is Josh Stoll. I'm assistant professor in the School of Marine Science. I've had the privilege of getting to work with this incredible network of community-based fishing organizations over the last really more than a decade now. I've learned so much from this experience and it, it really comes down to um, a lot of people on the ground doing innovative work. And so um, my, my really goal of this presentation is to make one point and then to invite you to be part of this sort of next step, sort of looking towards the future. And to make that point, I wanna share sort of two disconnected ideas and hopefully stick them together for that point. Next slide. This is a photo of a fisherman from Eastern North Carolina, his name's Lynn Chestnut. I got to know him over the course of a decade. Um, he's, a, he's an inshore fisherman. He, he digs flounder. He was part of a community supportive fishery and cooperative that started. He was one of the founding board members. Just as this co-op was starting, he had an injury. And I, I was part of this process of bringing fishermen together, doing this sort of cooperation, not cooperation dance that, that Pete described. Um, we, were, we were running a community supported fishery. It was getting all kinds of attention. Um, it, it was one of the sort of the most exciting moments of my professional career. And he had an injury, uh, a back injury. And um, I ended up spending some time with him. Um, he moved back um, to, to live with his mother and brought his family back. And I had the opportunity to um, to visit him in the middle of North Carolina, at the back of a, a, a tobacco plantation in a trailer. And, and uh, actually he had to sign some of the co-op documents. And at that moment, I sort of had this realization that this work, this energy that we've been pouring into starting this direct marketing ar arrangement, it was so small in comparison to the challenges that many small scale community based fishermen, many rural people face that connect the healthcare issues, that connect the education, that connect the poverty. And I had this moment of, oh my God, this work is so much bigger than selling seafood. I relayed that experience to uh, a CFO of a very prominent nonprofit organization in the United States. And he looked me right, right in the face and said, Josh, stay in your lane. Those issues aren't related to what you're doing. You work on fisheries, and that's what you should work on. Next slide, please. Second point, the United States, and I think this is not true just in the United States, but I share this with you, has a major food security issue. This is data published by the US Census Bureau. Um, and they've been collecting data through the pandemic. Every other week, they've been running a, a national survey. They've run 45 of them from May 2020 to May 2022. And next slide, please. Um, if you zoom into this last survey, um, and just to orient you, blue is people with enough food. Um, this kind of greenish color is, is, not, is enough food, but they don't feel like they have the right types of food. Um, this yellow and, and um, is not enough food and not often enough food. And the, the dark orange is not enough food um, sometimes. If you zoom in to just a given week, we're talking about 14% of adults in the United States have some type of food security issue. Next. 
That translates to 37 million people. My point here is this idea, next slide please, is that our work can't be about staying in our lane. It has to be about getting out of our lane. These issues of food, these issues of health, these issues of poverty, these are the types of issues that have inspired me to continue to work in this space because these communities that are part of the local catch network, the work that we saw today, they're not just about selling seafood, right? They're about connecting with these broader issues. And this is, this is really at the core of what these alternative models are. It's not about how much can we make for our seafood, that's part of it, of course, right? But it's about reinvesting this work in our communities that we care deeply about, right? And so, um, uh, next slide, please. I promised I'd be short. <laughs> Hopefully those two points stuck together and they made sense. Um, we've been doing this work through the local catch of building this network, doing this work that Jordan described now for, for more than a decade. This is crazy to me. It makes me feel really old. Um, just a couple weeks ago, when the US Congress passed their budget, the US Congress, like this is this is this is big. They included a line item for, for two million dollars to invest in our work to strengthen um, local and regional seafood systems. <laughs> I'm getting emotional about it for some reason. <laughs> I have two little kids and I don't sleep very much. <laughs> so um, starting this fall, we're, we're launching this effort um, to, to invest in this work in, in a real way. And next slide, please. Um, and it's focused on four things. Um, the first is around catalyzing interdisciplinary research related to small scale fisheries and local and regional seafood systems. Um, Let me tell you, talkers. Yeah, that's <laughs> helpful. <laughs> um, it's been a long day. Uh, uh, so this is this opportunity to really deeply invest in in the research around these systems, right? You've heard some really important stories. This is an opportunity to to invest in the research to to, to understand how these systems, um, to understand the scale of them, to understand who's participating in them, and so part of it is about collecting that baseline information. And then part of it is about the intersectionality to issues of access, to issues of poverty, to issues, to, to the issues that many of us what brought many of us to these to these issues, to these things. A second piece is around facilitating network building, and I'm really happy that you all volunteered to be part of that um, because that's really important. Jordan um, has been in, in sort of an incredible catalyst, and, and people like Sonia who've just stepped on to. Um, um, our executive committee are, are helping to build that network. We invite anyone who's interested in this to be part of it. Um, it includes funding for graduate students. If you know anyone, if you are one of those people, we want those people to engage in this work. Um, this is about building a pipeline of students, the future leaders uh, in this space to understand what we're talking about. It's not just about stock assessments. Yes, that's important, but it's also about food systems. Uh, and then the last piece is around providing technical assistance and training and resources to help catalyze this work. This is, um, uh, as Jordan mentioned, we, we've started doing some of this work. It's been really fulfilling. It's not just about studying it in, you know, sort of from afar, but it's actually leaning into it to say, how do we help this work move forward? Um, really proud of the fact that, you know, some of our work with um, USDA has helped fishing communities raise $3 million to actually go and do this work. And we're excited to do that at a bigger level. So the, the last slide is simply that um, opportunity, if you don't mind going to the next one. Um, yeah, this is an open invitation. Join the work that we're doing. The more, the more people who lean into this, the more transformative it will be. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back to you, Sophia. Thank you, Jordan. Um, Thanks, Josh. Okay, so we've got 15 minutes. Let's just get into questions. Let's start getting into discussions. Go for it. Do we want to? Yeah, we'll use chairs for kind of 
I don't know if we have the time. <laughs> so here, if I if I if I yes. may just add to to amplify what Josh was talking about too is is um, it's so huge because the U.S. Congress is so far more oriented, you know, and they've been you know Josh and others have been so resolute and just saying to Congress we need to bring the seafood world into this. So so that's been fantastic and. And the other thing is, I think, you know, the, the pandemic has stress tested our food systems tremendously and it showed where a lot of the weak points are, you know, we, you know, and so we need to, we need to be mindful of, of that as we move forward. And one of the things that the Wave Foundation is doing is trying to think about how to create, you know, help create a food system, seafood system that doesn't make food banks you know, that can, so food banks can sunset out. We don't need food banks, you know? Um, and, um, and so it's a, really, it's a really fascinating time to work on that. At the same time, there's a number of the local catch community that are working on what we call a fish drop. And this is in Alaska, because what we're finding out now is, is the, the salmon runs are really spotty in Alaska now, and we're having native villages that are not getting their salmon coming back. And this is this is so key, as we've heard a lot, is to to not just their their own food well, it's their food sovereignty and their cultural sovereignty. So what we're looking at is trying to get fish from salmon from fisheries that are operative to drop them into their their communities, it's because we need we need to have some system that that does that. But to also how to build a transactional system that supports that at a, on a on a regular basis, stuff like that not on an emergency basis. So there's some really exciting stuff going on, you know? And uh, so come to Alaska in October and get an update on all of that. You know, I want to add something. I met Josh 10 years ago or so. He says he's gotten old. When I met him, he was 12 years old. <laughs> I always called him the baby professor. He <laughs> looks like a 12 year old kid walking around. <laughs> In San Diego, we had a program called Fish to Town. So we see if you got a you got a market at the end of the market, you want people to bring a lot of fish there, but they can't take it anywhere and you don't want to sell it at half price. That that's nonsense that goes on. You have buyers coming at the end of the market. So I, I don't go for that. So what we started is brought some chefs down, we got some funding. To go to uh, to the poor people, we served eighty four thousand meals in a few months because we just cut up all the fish, they turned it into meals, and off they went out the door. So these are the, the community based things that you do. Uh, you do it for money because the fishing got to be paid for the thing, but but it's got to go to a good cause. So so the, the combination of the fishermen being able to subsist uh, during the pandemic, everybody was having problems. We didn't have any problems in San Diego. Uh, we fed 84,000 meals. Uh, we had uh, over 2,000 people would line up for the market because they couldn't buy fish anymore. And a lot of people started not going to restaurants after that, but we showed them how to cook fish. And, and then they didn't believe in the microwave, but that's my system. How do you cook fish? The way I do this, I hand it to my wife. I go and watch football. I <laughs> That's how I do it. I see. Yeah, I had a question. Um, I'm sorry, I had to stand that first night for so long. Um, Josh, I'm just curious if you would say, I'm sorry if I missed it, but like, could you say more about just like how you guys did that? How did you get Congress to pay attention? Like, that's just, it's huge. And, and you know, it's one of the like very academic, I think, what critiques is alternative food networks or seafood networks. It's like, oh, it's a little bit here, it's a little bit there. It's not going to, you know, it's these sort of islands in the sea of, you know, of, that you're not going to change. And so I'd like to hear, I just taught a class of undergrads on food systems, and they're like, tell me about this kind of change. And it's like, I didn't really have a good example for them, but I was sort of trying to make them believe that, like, maybe it's going to happen. It just hasn't happened yet. So maybe I would just like to hear more about it. Yeah, like how, the how. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. Um, to, to be really honest, I, I think we got really lucky. Um, and you know, we were in the right place at the right institution at the right time. Um, and 
the work connects to a lot of topics that a lot of different stakeholder groups are interested in the blue economy, for better or worse, um, uh, economic development, community development. Uh, and so in, in that way, it works. The University of Maine, where we're based, um, has a process um, that it uses to put, submit proposals um, up through the, the budget making process. I, I don't know how common that is. And so I submitted a proposal and was told it won't, wouldn't probably go anywhere. And somehow it just kept on working its way through the system. Um, yeah, but but I don't know. I think it, it checked a lot of boxes. And you know, we're based in Maine. Fisheries are important in Maine. Our congressional seats are important. Um, and so there's there's some of that politics that I don't claim to understand. Yeah. So, you so know, did he use King or something to support it? Oh, the whole congressional delegation. Did. Yeah. It is. It's shocking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a question for Josh as well. Uh, and forgive me, but I, I, I just heard when you were speaking. Um, I was interested in this person who uh, told you to to stay in your lane. Uh, and that was fisheries. Um, and you did, spoke to me a lot about how you realized how much bigger the problem was. Uh, you talked about um, even healthcare, for instance. Uh, and I wish I could remember which one of the very many papers I was reading before I came here uh, this month, uh, so I could give credit where credit was due. But um, the the author had mentioned, and I thought it was a very salient point. I've been thinking about it ever since. Uh, that you know we don't manage when we speak about governance and that sort of thing. We're not speaking about managing fish, we're speaking about managing fishers. And it's very much about you know the, the human connection and the, the management of how we interact with that natural resource. Uh, so one side of that entire equation, um, if not the side we are actually managing, has to do with the people involved in that interaction. Uh, and so well-being and healthcare and everything else uh, to me um, is sort of, should just be a very natural part of that. Um, I was wondering if you would uh, speak a little bit to whether, uh, to what uh, extent, I guess, you think he was uh, right or wrong in what he said, or to what extent um, maybe he sort of uh, missed America entirely his understanding of what fisheries are. The way that I described it, tried to describe it in this talk is it's missing the mark. I think we, we have a management system that at least in the US context, primarily focuses on what happens on the water. And then post water, we say, well, it's, it's the marketplace. But fisheries belong to all of us. And how we structure those markets, how, we, how seafood moves through that product impacts who gets it and who eats it and who has access to it. And those are, you know, that's connecting back to the, these questions of health and, and well-being. And I I think we, in the US at least, I think we've missed the mark in how we manage fisheries for the well-being of our of our people. The fact that that 14% of American adults, and if you if you look at the data for kids, it's even higher, like are struggling and and we exported four billion dollars worth of product last year. Like What's going on? And I, I'm not an economist. I don't claim to be one. Um, but my sort of naive perspective on that is maybe we could do better. Maybe we could think about it from a more holistic perspective that includes what happens after the product leaves, leaves the market. And I think the case studies we heard today, and our, our network is full of these, are people that are pushing the envelope here to say it is partly about making money but it's also about how do we use these resources to, to support our communities in a meaningful way. And, and that's, to me, I think that's the frontier in fisheries management and fishery and the fishery space. So, you know, that's, if, if I may add, add to that, you know, one of the keynoters yesterday, our plenary speakers talked about the power of language. Yeah. And, and so one of my, in, in, in the States, the law is, about sustainable fisheries is the Magnus Stevens Sustainable Fisheries Act. I would like it to be the Sustainable Fisheries and Seafood Act. Mm -hmm. So you put that you you put that in at the highest level. So you keep pointing to that. Mm -hmm. 
And I think uh, with direct marketing, I think fishing has changed. You went fishing, you threw your fish on the dock, somebody came with a truck, picked it up, they paid you and it was done. Now you gotta start thinking, well, I'm not gonna throw it on the dock. Where are the people that are gonna eat this? I've gotta get as close to them as I possibly can. And, and you see, a, a very fortunate in a large city like San Diego, because there's poor people, there's all kinds of people. So you can try to reach all of them at a certain price level and so on. That, 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 but you have to, you have to take care of the poor as well as, as, as everybody else. <laughs> but what happened to us is we started serving a, a bluefin tuna, a swordfish to these poor people. And all of a sudden, the people from the wealthy area went down to Goodwill and bought these cheap clothes so they could line up with the poor people to get this good food because it was better than at their restaurants. I'm only kidding. <laughs> but, but that's... That's where fishing changes. Once, once you decide that you're not just going to throw it on the docks and a wholesaler or buyer picks it all up, everything changes. Then you start thinking. And in the seafood chain of custody, everybody knows one up and one down. That, that's basically it. The fisherman knows who he sells it to. He knows who he bought it from and who he sells it to. Sometimes it goes through eight hands. And all they know is the guy this side and that side. So if I, I may also add another thing, there's a sibling organization for local catch um, in the slow food world. Yeah. And so it's, we, we call it slow fish and we call it slow fish in North America because we're bundling together in the U.S. and, uh, uh, and Canada. And um, uh, a number of us here have, have really been a generator of the slow fish world. One of the initiatives that, that slow fish North America will we're bringing to the slow food chapter world is what we call the rising tide event. And so this is an opportunity to, to bring fish to, to the local level, you know, to float all boats and rise all tides. And it's just simply, we are gonna offer an a la carte menu of activities that a chapter could say about fishing, anything about policy level, cooking, whatever. A chapter could say, oh, I'd like to do these five things or more, and then we'll connect them with local fishers, things like that. So then they, in each locality, you can learn more about fish. So it's not just a coastal, you know, uh, phenomenon and stuff like that. So there's, there's, there's fun initiatives like that, you know, to be as in, in the slow food world, we call, you know, go with joy, joy with justice, or justice with joy, stuff like that. So, so a lot of fun stuff. Okay, awesome. Um, we've got five minutes left, so I'm maybe going to wrap up this discussion with a few closing remarks from Sonia. She just asked me to do 30 seconds ago, but that's okay, I can totally do this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 20 seconds right there. Oh, 20 seconds. Yeah, we are, sorry, sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I think this has been a fascinating panel. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Is it good? Yeah. So uh, really exciting about being in this room here for me and I, 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 I think when you go out of here, you should tell everybody how they missed out, because this is the session where we connected all the dots, right, because we're talking here about fish, not as stock assessment pieces of, you know, organism material in the ocean, we're not talking about fish as separate from people or ecosystem or community or health. We've, we've connected all those dots together and I think that's, that's the beautiful thing about what's happened in this room here. There are so many people doing this work. We heard from Pete and we heard from Kevin uh, about uh, you know, examples of the work that they're doing. And that work is always all these things woven together. It's not just, none of us are just doing food businesses to sell fish. None of us are fish delivery companies, right? And I think likewise, the work here that we hear from what Josh is doing, what Sakir is working on, and what Jordan's doing at Local Catch is again, that same thing. It's bringing together people who are doing research, bring the funding from congressional funding to address this kind of work. We're connecting those dots. We're not allowing academic work to live in a, in a silo somewhere as sort of separate from on the ground work that fishers are doing in their communities uh, and that people are doing uh, to address the, like, the key element of our time, health, food insecurity, uh, uh, climate change, these things. So I, I think this is a beautiful panel to pull all of those things together. Um, I want to make a little plug for local catch and the summit as well. 
I hope that you will all consider that that is a summit for you as well. And I think some of the most beautiful things that have happened here at this Congress will happen in spades in Alaska at the local catch summit as well. And we've talked here today about how do we get more, you know, fishermen in the room? Well, come to local catch because there are going to be lots of people in all these different aspects, harvesters and people running these kinds of businesses and academics and researchers and people from governments and First Nations will be there. Uh, my own personal mission is to get more Canadians there. And I, have, I am hell-bent, I'm telling you, to get more Canadians in the room. And uh, I'm super excited. We've had a huge response over the last few months as I've been pushing people uh, to get people, particularly from you know, the East Coast to come, come to the West Coast, getting First Nations to come and be in the room and to share their perspectives and what they're doing around food security and to make those connections in their communities. So I really hope that you'll consider that is that is a summit for you as well. I hope that you'll consider Why don't you tell him Josh got two million dollars, he's gonna be there. <laughs> and, oh, he's gonna no, pay for no. it. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's gonna it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be really great. And and the local cash network really is doing incredible work. So I hope that you'll connect um, and join us there online. Is that all I wanted to say? Uh, plug for the seafood summit. Yeah, that's 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 pretty much what I wanted to say. Did you okay? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you all did so good. I hope you have a good evening. So you, Jordan? Thank you all. Go to Alaska. Go to the summit. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.